All right, aloha, ka'ako. Welcome to everyone that's joining us today for another Hawaiian Basis Species Awareness Talk Month talk as we are venturing into Valkanaka. And we are being joined today by Maui Invasive Species Committee. Hi, I'm Beth with the Hawaiian Basis Species Council. And as everybody is joining us, for those joining us live for the webinar, um, I am going to post a little poll to ask you where you're coming from, a little bit of your background. We really appreciate you sharing this information with us as it really helps us with our planning for these events. And I think here's Serena with MISC. Yep. Aloha my kako. Mahalo everybody for joining us for As the Blob Grows, How Do LFA Move with um, Catherine Marley Marlin. Um, we're also here with about 90% of our Little Fire Ant team here in Maui Invasive Species Committee. Uh, Brooke Mankin is here along with Monty Tudor Long. They're here in support of Marley and um, will be available for questions after her presentation. Um, just some housekeeping on the format of our webinar. So if you're in our Zoom presentation, um, we won't be able to see you or hear you, but you can engage and please do engage, ask questions, um, you know, shout out some comments to Marley in the chat or the Q&A feature. Um, we'll be monitoring that and then we'll bring it to Marley's attention after her presentation um, for her to answer any questions that you have as well as the rest of the crew. If you're joining us on Facebook Live, um, you can do the same thing, but in the comment feature um, below the video. So please feel free to engage and to ask questions, to put in comments um, and make this as interactive as we can in this type of format. Um, so without further ado, I think we have a few seconds left on the poll. How's that poll going, Beth? Oops, it disappeared for me. I think uh, most of the folks joining us have, have participated in the poll. I'll share the results really quickly with everybody. So we have um, people joining us here in the Zoom webinar from all over the state and from a lot of different backgrounds. So thank you very much. Mahalo. Awesome. Mahalo. Those polls are really helpful for us to plan for future HISAM events. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Catherine Marlin, or we call her Marley. She's a field technician with the Maui Invasive Species Committee and started in October 2021 with the Little Fire Ant crew. She graduated with a uh, Bachelor's of Science in Biological Sciences from the University of California, Santa Barbara, and an MS in Natural Resources from Humboldt State University. Uh, without further delay, I would like to kick her off and take it away, Marley. Hello. Um, yep. My name is Catherine Marlin, or Marley, field technician for Maui Invasive Species Committee. Welcome to As the Blob Grows, How Do LFA Move? So uh, first, it's important to understand what makes ants invasive. This puts species on the radar for invasive potential and helps to eradicate invasive ants as they come to us. Um, invasive ants are different from ants in general. Only 1.7% of all ant species are invasive. They usually come from high disturbance adapted species, such as floodplains, wind, um, anything that destroys their habitat and so that they can rebuild better. In other words, if an invasive species was one of the three piggies, it would be helpful if the big bad wolf load their house down. Because if your house is standing for too long, other critters might start to move in. And maybe when your house is blow down, you can actually build two houses in its place. So it's a good thing for an invasive species. Um, but the kind that we find all over the world are only a subset of this whole disturbance adapted species in which they became adapted from natural disturbances to human disturbances. Um, since not very many species can live with human disturbance, just like floods or natural disturbances, we provide a blank slate 
where tramp ants can do very well, so well that they become pesky to us humans. Um, so biological characteristics of an invasive ant or tramp ant is that they have become adapted to living with humans. Next, uh, we have budding or fission. This is where, um, this is how the blob grows. This is when the colony can break off and then grow again and can just cycle breaking apart and growing just like the Hydra and Disney Hercules where if you cut the head off, three more grow back in its place. This is different from other ant species where that do nuptial flights. Nuptial flights is when males and females fly at the same time of the year, mate in the air and then land on the ground. Budding or fission is much slower than flights. It goes to the house next door instead of the city over. Um, so it's the blob grows slower, but it's very effective because the habitat is right and they're right next to their sister colony where that may have even set the safe stage for success. The next biological characteristic is that they have multiple queens. The queens are usually hard to find, um, but the queen is necessary for a new colony to break off and then grow again. Um, so multiple queens makes a colony breaking off more likely to survive. Finally, they are very aggressive towards other species. This may serve as a food source and also make less competition for food. Um, moreover, it lowers biodiversity and can have cascading effects throughout the ecosystem. Moving on to little fire ants um, or Wasmania or Pactata. Um, afterwards, I'll just refer to them as LFA. They are one of the 100 worst invaders in the world throughout the tropical climates and in Hawaii Islands infesting Hawaii Island, Oahu, a small part of Kauai and Maui. In Maui, we have been gathering spatial information as we combat LFA with a goal of eradication or completely getting rid of them. While ants provide ecosystem services in other parts of the world where they're native, this isn't true in Hawaii because we have no native ants. So because of this, no native ants, it's possible that invasive ants can do extra well here. There's no competition, only opportunity. So they can fill this empty niche, flourish, and diminish our native Hawaiian species. Um, this is bad, but also for eradicating, perhaps helpful because we don't affect any native ant species while we are treating. Moving on to biological characteristics of LFA, they are monomorphic, which means that they all look the same, all workers look the same, they are about 1.5 millimeters long, about the size of how thick a penny is. Um, if you saw them from just standing, you can't see them at, at your feet usually. Um, they possess unique genetics. Um, usually the mom and dad create females that are a little bit different from the queen. Um, and the society is almost entirely female, but in LFA, the queens create females that are the same as them. As a side effect, when colonies break off and form a new one, it's the same genes. Um, this may result in or just be um, supplementary to their low intraspecific aggression, which means aggression amongst their species. They get along with each other, their sisters, maybe not all sisters and humans get along, but they definitely do. Um, they also are unicolonial, um, which means instead of many small colonies, they almost behave like one giant super colony. What do we know about LFA movement already? We know that they move at an estimated rate of 72.9 meters per year. This is our best number of rate of spread for LFA. And it's also known that they can spread faster due to human activity. 
Um, in other parts of the world, they've been seen to be faster. But this isn't as well studied. And from here on, we use 72.9 meters per year as our rate of spread. Um, things that might make them move faster um, are possibly moving through streams. It's well known that Argentine ants can float downstream, um, but still human mediated dispersal is the most significant fastest way, way to make ants spread. Um, LFA stream dispersal isn't well studied, but possible because their native habitat is floodplains. Um, they are associated with high disturbance and they have multiple queens making downstream colonization more likely. Um, also, because they can rapidly colonize after flooding, this also facilitates their invasive habit alongside humans. Where do they come from? They come from Central and South America um, and since have spread throughout tropical areas, devastating biodiversity. Um, to Maui, they came from Florida, then Big Island in 1999 and Maui in 2009. Early detection has been fundamental to making eradication a reasonable goal. And in our discussion, we hope to find out where and when LFA were introduced to each infestation we found. How does the blob grow? In our discussion, we will look at land usage, the general shape of the infestation and why, the ant density shown in light blue to dark blue, light be blue being low density, dark blue being high density, using our delimitation data, which is our extensive surveys, much larger than what you see here um, prior to any treatments. Um, this is shown in our infestations, only the vials where we found LFA. Um, other limitations include the amount of peanut butter we might have used in the vials, um, the time of day, the weather, um, how the vial is placed. So keep in mind, the density shown here may not be the true density of the ant colonies surrounding it. We also have geometric mean, which is the mean of all of the vials, just distance, um, and the weighted mean, which will lean more towards where more LFA were found. Um, geometric mean is the purple dot and weight, weighted mean is the red dot. Uh, finally, we also have the one year radius in red, that is 72.9 meters based on that article that I mentioned earlier and the best fit radius. We call the best fit radius, um, the smallest circle that we could draw around all of our points, find that radius and put it around the weighted mean. So first up, we have our haiku number one infestation. It was farm residence mixed. It was not known where or how the ants got there, but we are sure that it was humans somehow. We can see that it's a circular shape and the best fit was 82.48 meters divided by our 72 number. It was around 14 months. Same, some things affecting the shape of this blob is this road, which pretty much served as a barrier. Next, we are looking at elevation. Uh, the red is high elevation, blue is low, low elevation. The first and foremost factor for elevate dispersal here is humans. Um, we know that humans brought them here and we, they could easily also spread it around through propagating plants, moving plants around, soil, wood, any organic material that's just sitting around. Um, this is again, farm and houses. So it could be landscaping or the agricultural use um, and just moving things around could bring the ants along with it. Um, however, the circular shape suggests that ants move in all directions around them, um, possibly 
on their own. Something to keep in mind here regarding elevation, as you can see, the blob is mostly in this red area and it was a very flat area. So um, if it's flat and we're looking at it from the air, um, it'll be more similar to the aerial distance. The ground distance is similar to the aerial distance. But if it's hilly, the ground distance is larger than the aerial distance. So that would affect how we see the radius and estimate the time of introduction. Next, we have our way low infestation. This one has a bullseye. This is what I refer to as um, this dark blue blodge um, surrounded by light blue. Um, and in the middle is our weighted mean, which was really close to um, gardening materials. So that was suggestive of maybe how that those ants were brought there. Um, the best fit was around 13 months. Some things affecting the shape of this blob were these three roads. The um, easternmost road with the la dashed lines was a pretty solid barrier and also a paved road. Whereas the middle two roads were dirt roads all within the same property. Um, so there were more trees crossing over the roads. The ants are arboreal, they can cross on the trees. And also humans can more easily bring ants along like all over within their property as opposed to across the street. You also notice um, in this elevation map, we have some um, LFA kind of to the north outside the circle. This is downhill, but it's also along this north-south running road. Most likely um, humans brought it along this road. Um, so that's a natural corridor. Next, we have this infestation in central Maui. Um, the means were really close to a greenhouse. Again, it's a bullseye. The best fit was around 10 months. Our shape is roughly, roughly circular, but more semi-circular because there's this road, paved road at the bottom of the hill. And also the ants spread out kind of more along the bottom of the hill, along the houses. Um, looking at elevation, we can see um, that they don't go so much uphill. They kind of stay along the houses and don't cross the road, which kind of creates this unusual shape. Um, so perhaps slope impeded ant spread because Plant made, things will fall down, things will fall downhill, organic material will fall down, um, and that can maybe impede their spread rate. Um, but another very strong possibility and general thing to factor to think about is moisture. Um, higher moisture will cause ant growth to be higher. So there's more moisture in these housing areas, there's more shade plants, even irrigation, whereas on the going uphill, it's kind of an exposed hillside that's very seasonally uh, dry and hot. Um, so that definitely affected our shape and created this semicircular shape. We have our haiku number two infestation here. Um, our mean by number is very close to a recently built fence. Um, that just goes to show it doesn't always have to be potted plants. It can also be maybe wood, um, but this is just an assumption. Um, our best fit was around 16 months. Uh, we have two rivers through this infestation meeting in the middle. They cross the river on the west side, but not so much on the east side. They had, we also found two other vials, 300, 400 meters downstream, but none in between. So that is very suggested, suggestive that there was some downstream dispersal of LFA, maybe floating down on a log um, or other materials, or maybe they just got washed downstream. Um, 
So streams can impede you know, ant dispersal or they can actually carry them down. We can see that more clearly here in our Wahei Valley infestation. Uh, this didn't really have a bullseye. Um, the mean by number was very close to crops. Our best fit was around 21 months. And for the most part, the ants couldn't cross the river. Um, it's not easy or very possible for a little fire ants to cross running water. Um, but again, they are arboreal, arboreal so you, they can go over bridges via these trees. And that one spot kind of to the west side of our infestation is where they cross the river where, um, by a banyan tree. And to our east, you can see one spot where they may have been carried down, downstream a little bit. Streams are both penetrable barriers and vectors for spreading ants, it seems. Again, you can see with the elevation, um, maybe because of more, less moisture, that the ants didn't seem to spread very far uphill. Finally, we have our Nihiku infestation. This is extraordinarily long. It is 3,000 meters long. Um, which would put us at 41 years, which is very, very unlikely um, because little fire ants were introduced to the state of Hawaii only 23 years ago. Um, my boss, Brooke, gave a presentation about our treatment of this infestation yesterday. You can view the recording on the DLNR website. There is no bullseye. As you can see, the means don't seem to work very well here. Um, but if we zoom in on the star we put at the uphill, upstream portion of the infestation nearby a house, we can roughly find a circular shape. Um, the farthest point outward from the stream was around 90 meters, which would be around 15 months. Um, Look, as 90 meters as opposed to 3,000 meters is a very fast rate um, caused by this stream dispersal. Um, and again, this is just an assumption, but this is our best hypothesis for how LFA got here. Um, LFA can only be introduced by humans in Maui. There's no other way for them to move this far away. So possible factors for the rate of spread in summary, humans, terrain complexity, slope, moisture, and streams. And you can see all of that in play here in Nihiku. Summing up all of our infestations that we talked about in our discussion, they are mostly in wet parts of the island, uh, North Shore, Hana, or otherwise in residential areas where they were given, uh, where they're surrounded by irrigation and shade um, and also humans where, where they could have been brought there or spread around by humans. Um, all of our weighted means seem to land in locations that had a possible, good a possible explanation, um, crops, greenhouses, uh, fairly new fences that fit within our timeline. Um, so it's possible because of the shape of the infestations that were roughly circular, we can use 72.9 meters per year or hopefully other better um, research articles coming to find when and where our infestations began. This can be really helpful because we do tracing um, Tracing is through interviews with known infestations, finding out where LFA came from and where did they go? Where did they come from? Where did they go? For example, the Department of Agri Agriculture has traced um, an infestation in Kauai to the big Hawaii Island. They traced it back to Hawaii Island and then traced it forward to a Maui nursery. And another example, 
Maui Invasive Species Committee through interviews um, with one of our infestations found traced forward and found that the owners of one infestation had moved Kiave posts to another new infestation. Tracing is our most effective tool for finding new infestations, but we have problems with it because people may not always know what was brought to the land, when or how, they may be, may be new to the location or just simply unable to remember what they brought because they may maybe they're bringing things all the time. So it'd be really helpful um, if we have, you know, this radius and rough timeline so we can find out, we can look to this area and tell them roughly when something might've been brought here. And that may spark their memory. They might help us like find out, trace back or trace forward and find new elf, new elf infestations. Um, however, reporting is how we've found most infestations. So I'm going to talk about that now. Um, best practices. How many ants do you need to need to move to start a new colony? Uh, you need to move at least several ants and a queen to start a new infestation. Though they are small, though they are small, and it is very unlikely you'll pick it up just through passing through, through hiking or um, through your boots or whatever. Um, usually you have to be moving materials such as plants, produce, construction materials, soil, any natural material sitting around. So how do you avoid moving them? Uh, know your source material. Uh, be careful about getting island <laughs> items from Hawaii Island. Uh, ask your nurseries how they prevent little fire ant imports. T test new plants or your yard uh, regularly. You can do a test by grabbing a stick with peanut butter, mayonnaise, spam, laying it out for one hour, coming back, picking it up, Put it in a Ziploc bag and put it in your freezer and you can send that to us mailing it in or dropping it off. We welcome all samples. We are looking for LFA and other potentially invasive species such as um, red imported fire ants. And we are also cataloging. So what are some of the ants we have or we're looking for? Little fire ants. Um, these are all stinging ants uh, where this is a persistent pain. It can, may develop a rash. Little fire ants will have many small stings. Usually what happens is you're walking through bush and you get stung on your neck and back, but you don't see anything. Um, tropical fire ants are another really common stinging ant in Maui. They result in larger smoke swelling. So looks more like a pimple than like a little pinprick. Um, and they have a much, they have a huge difference in size. If you're looking at your feet while standing, you can see tropical fire ants, whereas you can't see a little fire ant. Tropical fire ants tend to be around beaches and dry areas, whereas little fire ants tend to be in moist areas. Tropical fire ants will also usually bite around your feet and ankles as opposed to your neck and back. The ant that we're on the lookout for um, that's very similar to tropical fire ants is not yet in Hawaii and looks very similar to tropical fire ant. Um, but one behavioral difference is that they can create big mounds that are maybe like three feet wide um, anything bigger than like your arm, like around your arm is an obvious sign of red imported fire ants. But again, we really want you to send report and send any, any ants, but especially stinging ants, um, because it could be, it could be something new, could be something we already have either way. It's helpful. So again, something helpful to distinguish is the difference between bites and stings. Many ants bite, but stings create rashes and itching. 
please report the location where it happened through address, um, pin drop or description, describe um, before, during and after the sting, uh, where the stings are, what they feel or look like. You can find more resources for reporting on stoptheant.org and mail or drop off at our PO box here. Our phone number is 808-573-6472 for Maui Basis Species Committee. But for all islands, it is 808-643-PEST. Thank you for dropping in and listening to my presentation. I'd like to give a shout out to all of the support at Maui Invasive Species Committee, management and crew. Monty provided the photography that I've used in this uh, presentation. Brooke Mankin and Serena Fukushima have given me lots of help in creating the presentation. Shout out to the field crew, Fanny, Joe, Makiala, Department of Agriculture, Research Cor Corporation of the University of Hawaii, PCSU, Hawaii Invasive Species Council, County of Maui, Hawaii Ant Lab, and of course the Maui community. Thank you. Mahalo Marley, that was great. Um, we're just throwing some links in the chat as well that you mentioned in your presentation. Um, does anybody have any questions in our Facebook page or in our Zoom for Marley uh, about her presentation. I do see one from Bill Pereira. Maybe um, Brooke and Monty can help jump in on this one too. Um, but it says aloha to the US representatives who may be viewing this presentation now that we have a safe chemical treatment for LFAs. May we borrow a couple Air Force C-130 mosquito spraying planes that can spray 80,000 acres a day during the off season on the mainland and use them for ant control here. So I think that might be um, more of a question for Brooke or Monty if you wanna tackle that one. Monty, uh, you're on mute, but do you have uh, anything to say about that? I'll just say that it would be nice if we could do better at controlling ants uh, using airplanes on the mainland. Um, some people may know that there was a huge effort, very similar to what Bill describes, to control red imported fire ants in the South uh, back in the 60s and 70s. And it was kind of a disaster. It actually made the problem worse. Um, and it's important to note that there are native ants all over North America. And so killing every ant in an area isn't advisable in an area that has native ants. It really upsets the, the ecosystems. And that's what they found when they were trying to kill red imported. Yep, that, that's very uh, interesting. But uh, in the case of in Hawaii, we, we don't have um, other native ants. So, uh, you know, something like that, uh, widespread control of ants is totally uh, feasible in Hawaii. It would take a lot of money and effort and dedication to do that. But um, like what Bill is talking about there is something that would be um, that you would want to think about in terms of eradication on the big island for little fire ants. Um, the other infestations throughout the state are um, discrete meaning that they have boundaries and we know where they are. Whereas on the big island, it's, um, it's really sort of out of control. And um, it is, um, to borrow from Marley's presentation, the blob is growing and it's a very large blob. And so, you know, uh, aerial control with, with airplanes is um, probably the only way that you would be able to get rid of or shrink that very large infestation. Um, that would, it would be really cool to, to see something or to, to talk more about how that might work. But I think we're probably a ways away from anything, um, any efforts of that magnitude. 
Yeah, and if you want a little more information on aerial control that um, MISC has been doing in our Nahiku infestation, which is a pretty um, new technology in, in the sense of the control that we're using for LFA here, you can see um, Brooks recording yesterday um, specifically on our Nahiku infestation. And I just dropped the link in the chat, the recording, I believe the recording's up already, right? Beth, wow, you're fast, Beth is fast. She's putting them all up there. So you can go take a look at that. Um, I saw another question in the Q&A. Do you know if these data sets analysis is being implemented on other islands? And I'm thinking that's in reference to your um, presentation, right, Marley? So uh, if you know if these are being implemented on other islands or Brooke can jump in there too. I think we also have sure. some I can come in representatives. Here. Uh, I think what Marley has done here today is totally novel. Um, I, I am not aware of anybody doing uh, the type of analysis that Marley has shown us today. Um, it, it's really interesting. We worked on this together and um, it would be really cool to see other islands do this sort of analysis. Uh, I also think that it would be cool to have a statewide little fire ant conference where we all get together and talk about big ideas and little fire ants um, that what Marley showed you today could be a really useful tool like she was describing the trace back and trace forward. And I'm just gonna uh, reiterate what she spoke about is um, we often find these infestations and we're interviewing um, residents and owners and um, you know, we're like, hey, so do you know if you moved anything in the last 10 years? And they're like, yeah, I moved all sorts of stuff. I have no idea. What are you talking about? And, and we can't really pinpoint like uh, what it might've been, but being able to use the analysis that Marley just did to sort of get a better ballpark area of, of like when that might've been moved based on the size and spread of the infestation, we might be able to coax out more information from those people and um, you know, and if that leads to, oh, well, it was this one thing that I brought in, we need to trace back from there to see, well, where did that one thing come from? And that might lead to another discovery of a new infestation. And so that's why tracing is so important. However, tracing has not um, been totally successful all the time. It's usually dead ends. And the, the, the main way we find out about little fire infestations are from people getting stung and reporting. And so awareness is really important. But um, I know that was kind of a rambling and long answer uh, to that question. And uh, sorry about that. But um, yeah, this is a new analysis. Nobody is um, doing this to my knowledge. Great. Well, you heard it first here. And hi, Sam. Um, stay tuned for more. Um, Bill has a trivia question. Would you know what happens when isolated blobs encountered each other? Would they exercise low intraspecific aggression? I think Monty probably would be a good person to answer that. Sure, sure. Uh, they would continue to exercise low intraspecific aggression. All the LFA in Hawaii are essentially clones of each other. It's very common for invasive ants in huge areas to all be descended from a very low number of introductions. And so you can have whole continents of very closely related ants that all think they're from the same queen. And in Hawaii, this is the case. Um, to the best of our knowledge, there was all, all of our ants are descended from a single introduction event from Florida. And so whether the, the, there's no differentiation from a blob on one side of the island to another side of the island. Very interesting, very Game of Thrones. I like that. So if the two blobs came together, they become a super blob pretty much. <laughs> not good, not good. <laughs> we'll keep those blobs apart. Um, any other questions? Thanks, Bill, for that trivia question. Any other questions from our Zoom or Facebook viewers. Oh, we have one from Marianne. Can LFA live or can LFA without a queen create an infestation on their own? Um, I, I would 
direct this to Monty again. He's our uh, ant expert. So all studies indicate that a, a queen is required, um, a fertile queen, and that she requires several workers to help her start a new colony. There have been studies showing that a fertile queen on her own will not succeed and a partial colony of workers with larvae will also be unable to raise the larvae into, they, they wouldn't be able to raise a, a, say a new queen from the larvae, but it would also disappear. So a, a movement of worker ants, even if there's larvae, will not lead to a new infestation unless there is a queen, a fertile queen also included. Well, that's a relief. Yeah, very interesting. <laughs> Thank you, Monty. Good to know. Any other questions? These are all really great questions. Mahalo everybody for, um, for these and for Monty and Brooke supporting Marley. Any other questions? I think we've been pretty thorough. So looks like we don't have any. Um, if you guys think of anything in the next couple of minutes, please put them in. But I'm going to just go ahead and share our link again for our high sound presentations that are coming up for the rest of the week. Um, we have a full schedule. So please come in, um, jump in when you can live, as well as checking out the Hawaii Invasive Species Council YouTube and um, this DLNR link as well. And then any Maui Nui based presentations are going to be on our Maui Invasive Species Committee Facebook page. Um, tonight we have a presentation on two line spittlebug in Hawaii. It's a research update um, coming from Hawaii Island. If you're not familiar with two line spittlebug, um, this is a somewhat new invasive pest on Hawaii Island that we don't have on Maui just yet so far as we know, but can cause some devastating effects if it reaches here. So really encourage everyone to um, join that and check that out to learn a little bit about this new pest. Uh, tomorrow, we are going to hear from our plant crew, uh, Billy Pacheco and Ross Kamimoto, who are going to be giving an update on the 2021 work done on invasive pampas grass. So a year in review for that tomorrow afternoon at two o'clock. Um, and then going forward, uh, Friday, we have new detections in rapid response, which is an update from NISC with Adam Knox, as well as the Native Hawaiian Plant Society um, performing, presenting that uh, evening. So we have a full schedule in mornings and afternoons and evenings. So please check us out, come and attend. And I don't see any other questions. So with that, we will leave you folks. Mahalo again for attending and we'll see you soon. Aloha. Mahalo.